My name is Terry Thorson with Spinal Cord Injury BC, and I'm going to be sort of your host or master of ceremonies for today. So first, I just uh, want to thank our sponsor of these sessions, the Craig H. Nielsen Foundation. Um, as you may have heard, SCIBC has partnered with Dr. Krasiakoff on this grant and will be continued to host these online sessions with health professionals um, in the next few weeks. So uh, without further ado, today we are very grateful to have our special guest, expert UBC and Vancouver Hospital respirologist, Dr. Jeremy Rode. Uh, Dr. Rode, thank you so much for being here with us today and uh, I'll sort of let you take it away. Well, thank you, Terry. It's a pleasure to be online and talking to you all. Um, I'm, as Terry said, I'm a respirologist in Vancouver. I work at Vancouver General Hospital. You know, I've been practicing here for probably the past 30 odd years, 30 plus, I won't say how many plus, but a few years. And um, I'm, I work in the spinal cord unit. Uh, in, in the past, I've worked there. Um, I work with uh, patients going through GF Strong in Pearson Hospital. And uh, I'm the medical director of the Provincial Respiratory Outreach Program, which provides services you know, uh, for, for patients who, who require home ventilation. So. I think there's some questions now, so I'm, I'm happy to, there's a, quite a lot of questions. We should probably go into, into those. Let's do it. Um, are quadriplegics at greater risk of COVID? Uh, why or why not? And beyond physical distancing, what precautions can quads take? I haven't, I've looked in the literature and certainly I don't think there's any predisposition that people with spinal cord injuries, particularly quadriplegia, uh, are more susceptible to the COVID virus. Um, it's more a matter of if you get the virus, um, you know, you're a little more susceptible to its effects because of the, the involvement of the breathing muscles. Um, so the, the best way to deal with it is to prevent it and, and not contract it. And Bonnie Henry has been really good at leading us uh, in how we should do this. And we've, I think we've been very fortunate in BC you know, the number of cases of we've certainly flattened the curve, uh, so that that's been a huge impact. So, I, and I think obviously social distancing needs to be continued, and how long we need to do that for it remains to be determined. Um, and then taking other, I think it's now recommended if you're going out that you you seriously consider using a mask, and then um, you know avoiding. Uh, one of the risks, I guess, for, for people who are having caregivers coming in and out of the, of the, of the home is making sure that they're, they're healthy and, and uh, aren't going to transmit the disease to you because, you know, we're all staying home and I th clearly we have to stay home. But when people are coming into the home, then we're at a bit more risk and um, being very careful and advising the caregivers to be very careful in terms of washing their hands and and uh, if obviously if they're sick not coming to look after you and then it's good to be pre um, preemptive in terms of having uh, some backup plans if for some reason the caregiver you know can't arrive great thank you so as a quadriplegic i find it hard to breathe sometimes on a regular day what will f i feel like if i have symptoms so you know i'm a respirologist and, and the main problem with respiratory infections, which this is, it's a respiratory infection, is it increases the effort to breathe because it, if it causes, you know, in many cases, COVID-19, when it affects you, it will just cause, cause a cold and upper respiratory symptoms. And, and, but if it does uh, progress into the lungs, uh, then it, it has a chance of, of setting up a pneumonia um, which will lead to fever and chills and, and uh, excess phlegm production. And then, it, unfortunately, it can go on in some cases to what we call the adult respiratory distress syndrome, where the lung uh, it goes through what we call a cytokine storm. In other words, there's a sort of an exaggerated inflammatory response that, um, that mushrooms into a lot of inflammation in your lung. And, uh, you know, if hopefully it doesn't get to that point, um, and uh, in most cases it doesn't. Uh, if it does, then you know you 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 obviously um, need to get help, and there is lots of help available. So basically, if you just get a cold-like symptoms, there's 
You just need to be on guard for it going into your lungs and making you feel like you need to cough a lot and it's getting harder to breathe. And if that happens, then you, you need to seek medical attention quickly. And that's the same for everybody, but I think it's more important for people with spinal cord injury to, to seek help earlier because you know, you, you're, you're reserved to deal with the extra work of breathing associated with an infection uh, puts you at, at more risk. So you're not at more risk for the infection, you're just the more at risk for the consequences in terms of how it involves the lungs. I th the only thing that seems to stand out is, is um, people with uh, heart disease with high blood pressure. And it's something related to the uh, angiotensin converting enzyme that um, the receptor on the cells that's affected by antihypertensives seems to make people more susceptible. But beyond that, uh, I don't think there's anything to be concerned about in the spinal cord population. Does asthma or COPD increase your chance of contracting COVID-19? You know, surprisingly not. We thought that, you know, that often viruses like influenza virus, like even uh, SARS and certainly H1N1 tended to uh, be a bit more, make people, well, tend to be a bit more successful at, in infecting people who had underlying lung disease like COPD or asthma. But um, this one, the, the, there is a little bit of a, an increased tendency in people with chronic lung disease like COPD, uh, but it's not as striking as it has been with, with other uh, upper respiratory tract viral infections. Um, I had a partially collapsed lung in late January. If I catch COVID, will it kill me? <laughs> so partially collapsed, hopefully the lungs re-expanded now. Um, uh, but with um, spinal cord injury and quadriplegia, it is a little easier for the lung to collapse. So, and often it's because of mucus that gets stuck in the airways. And, and then the lung past that little obstruction collapses. And often with chest physio or with a cough assist device, for example, uh, you can expand that area again and, and then you're back to where you are before. So I, having had that collapse before, doesn't really, it, it should be a thing in the past. Um, if, but if you're more susceptible to getting collapsed lung and that you have a history of getting repeated collapsed lungs, then it, it's possible this infection may lead to that problem again because it will produce more secretions in the airways. So you have to be more attendant to clearing the secretions. Mm -hmm. Okay. What do I need to tell the ER if I need to be admitted? Well, I, you know, I was looking at the Spinal Cord Injury Canada website a little bit today and, and um, just in preparation for this. And I think there's a couple of things that they mention, and I, th I think it's something that we have in BC quite ready access to, is um, you need to uh, basically have any information re in relation to your injury available for the people who are attending you. Particularly if you're on a ventilator, you need to have the information about how your ventilator, what your ventilator settings are, uh, and so that they can make a smooth transition. Um, so, and you have to, Basically, it's always good to carry a list of the medications that you're taking with you. Um, and then if there are any particular issues related to the, the quad, your quadriplegia or your spinal cord injury that would be a little, you know, not out of, but out of the norm, then uh, those should be important to mention to the ER physicians or the ER people who are looking, looking after you. Great. So I'm just going to say in, in, in BC, we, because we have the prop program, if you are on ventilatory equipment and you don't know what they are, I think it's a good thing to write what your settings are down on a, on a card and have it with you or, or be able to give it to the people in the, in the emergency department. But if you don't have them, there is a 24 hour prop line that uh, is available um, and you can contact who's on call and they can access electronically your information in terms of what your ventilator settings are and what you're if you're using a cough assist device um, how frequently you do it and, and how um, what, what things to look out for uh, what is the triage product protocol when it comes to people with disabilities if the hospitals are full would people like me receive optimal care for example would we get a ventilator if needed well, absolutely. Um, I, I, 
you know, fortunately we're not in a triaging position, but I, I don't, I'm not aware of any protocol that would uh, lower people with spinal cord injury on the list of, of, um, of likely candidates for ventilatory support. So I, I, I don't think that's, that's an issue. I, and I don't know what issues where people were driven to consider as prior, ways of prioritizing people who require ventilation in, in countries where they were overwhelmed. For example, in Italy, I don't, I, I know they must have done some prioritizing, but I, I don't know. I, I suspect it's more related to things like people with uh, terminal illnesses uh, and elderly people with, um, you know, with very with some known uh, chronic conditions. If the prognosis is dire, are we given the chance to decline intubation? If, if the prognosis isn't dire? Is dire. Oh, is dire, yeah. If you, you, yes, I mean, I mean, that's always a decision and you have to let people know uh, in advance. And this is something that also would be good to carry with you is in terms of your advanced directives. If you weren't wanting to have intubation and mechanical ventilation, if, if you were unconscious when you came there and you didn't have that already written down somewhere, then um, that would be a, a challenge. But it's, it's incumbent upon physicians to know what the patient's requ requests are, should they need intubation. And if they don't want to have intubation or they don't want to have CPR, then it, it, they, the physicians are very aware of this. And that's one of the first things they'll establish when you come to emergency. Um, and then if you could uh, please thoroughly describe intubation, how it affects quads and their quality of life, uh, the question of pneumonia or odds of survival. So intubation is, is always a bit of a challenge, but it's no more challenging in patients, patients with spinal cord injury than it is in a general population. Um, it, it, it's, it's done fairly smoothly and people who are in the hospital have a lot of experience. So it's, um, it's a pretty smooth procedure. The, um, I think what's happening with the COVID, for example, is sometimes people are, are on a ventilator for a long time. Uh, and in which case they may need, because you can keep these endotracheal tubes when you're intubated in your airway for 10 days or so. But after that, if you're not off the ventilator, then a tracheostomy may be proposed as a way of, of um, getting you continuing to ventilate you safely and effectively, and then eventually get you off the ventilator. Because if you do get on a ventilator, it's usually because you've got this, as I was mentioning earlier, this you've had this cytokine storm in your lungs, a lot of inflammation, the lungs are very, almost like solid tissue, and very difficult to ventilate. But that will clear up, it's just a matter of time. So, and with the equipment we have these days, we can support the, the breathing and you don't have to worry about having muscle weakness and spinal cord injury because the ventilator does all the work. In fact, we, we like people just to not use their breathing muscles once they're on the ventilator. So it's just biding time to get the, the patient off the ventilator. And sometimes that has to be done with the use of a tracheostomy. It doesn't mean that you're stuck with a tracheostomy permanently because after your, your lungs are cleared up, you can usually get back almost all your function um, you may have lost some muscle mass and be, be weaker, but your lungs recover quite well. And then you should be able to get uh, the tracheostomy discontinued. Has there, there been any cases worldwide where a person with SCI got COVID? I'm still very afraid and will not allow anyone inside. So I, I've seen one paper with someone from Spain. Um, yeah. I don't know of any others, but... Uh, yeah, I'm... I mean, it's, I haven't seen it specifically reported. Um, I, I, I suspect it's not going to have any exceptions. So people with spinal cord injury are going to potentially get COVID. Um, it, and as I said, I, I think it will it take its course depending on the inflammatory response in your lung. If you don't get that big inflammatory response, then thankfully you'll, you'll eventually get immune to the virus and you'll clear it and, and um, you'll get back to your normal functioning. Mm -hmm. if, it, if it gets more active, then, then there, are, there are more dire consequences.
which can be managed. As, as I said, my prediction would be that you're not more susceptible. It may take a little longer to get you off the ventilator if, if you end up getting on a ventilator. Um, but in the end, it, it, you, your recovery should be similar to recovery of other people because the lungs do recover quite well from this, this uh, extreme inflammation. So next, why do you think that people living with SCI who get COVID-19 have been shown to present with less visible respiratory distress? So I'm not sure if you saw that paper, but um, uh, the individual uh, from Spain went in with what they thought was a bladder infection, didn't have any, um, actually any respiratory issues. Yeah. So. Well, uh, what, I, what I know of how it affects the lung is that there seems to be two types of inflammation. One type of inflammation uh, leads to the lungs getting very thick and heavy and, and, and making it difficult to breathe and, and intubation is required very quickly. The other kind leads to um, not so much stiffening in the lung, but it does affect oxygenation. So you can, and, and people um, who get that type of inflammation in the lung can get quite hypoxic and quite potentially sick, but they don't feel it very much. And so there's been one of the things that we're aware of in, in the medical community is that if somebody gets this infection nowadays, we should really check their oxygen level because, you know, we've got simple ways of doing that with an oximeter and we can see if there is evidence of this kind of less dramatic inflammation in the lung, which, and so people can be feeling quite well and, you know, people with spinal cord injury as well would be feeling, not noticing it, but could be quite hypoxic. The lung just doesn't get that stiff. And so people aren't aware, they aren't aware so much of the, the difficulty that's being presented in their lungs. It doesn't feel, because it's the effort of breathing that, that makes you notice it. People liken it to um, losing the power steering on your, on your car. So you're used to making an easy effort to go around the corner, all of a sudden it takes much more effort to, to do the things you can normally do easily. And if your lungs aren't that stiff, then you, you may not notice it very much. So will, uh, will not getting regular activity outside decrease my lung capacity? Um, actually, just breathing maintains your lung capacity. Um, it, it, the, the effort of breathing does maintain the function of your breathing muscles. Um, so I, I think as long as you're, you're breathing, it, it's one, for example, if you were going on a ventilator and your breathing was impeded and, and you were basically not breathing because the ventilator was doing all the work, then your breathing muscles would get weaker. But, but just by breathing, we tend to maintain the function of our breathing muscles. So um, going out and doing exercise, it's, it, it can help. It helps all your muscles, but for the breathing muscles, it's not critically important. So it's, I don't think it's a, a big factor. Okay. So what impact does uh, vitamin D play on the respiratory system's ability to combat COVID? Oh dear, <laughs> vitamin D. Um, I really, I don't, I don't know that that's, um, I, I don't have a good answer to that question. Vitamin D and the lung is, is not a, a very you know, well-studied area. I, I know there's been some interest in, in countries where they don't get much sunshine in, in places like England, uh, where it rains a little bit. <laughs> there has been some interest in, in uh, vitamin D and having low levels and being a little more susceptible to respiratory complications. But, I, I, it's not to the point where we're recommending you take vitamin D for as a way of protecting you against infections. Okay. Would you recommend exercises to build up respiratory muscle strength during this time? And if so, what exercises would be best? So um, I think ex exercises are, are good um, because it, it gets you active, it increases blood flow, um, it can improve muscle function. If you want to specifically improve the function of the breathing muscles, then you can do what's called inspiratory loading, where you just breathe through, a, like breathing through a straw or a resistor, and that just increases the effort of breathing. But um, you know how much you, you do that, and, and having a good routine for that, 
I don't think it's been well worked out as, as to how this would lead to any long-term benefits. Like I say, I, I think mostly the act of breathing is good. But if you do have a period where your lungs become inactive, like you're on a ventilator, then ways of helping re the muscles recover after that um, beyond just normal breathing would be important. Um, perhaps you could describe breath stacking and how it helps maintain healthy lungs. Yeah, I think this is a, this is a very important area um, in terms of maintaining your, your lung capacity and having the ability to clear secretions. So breath stacking basically is when it's done, we, um, we normally when we cough, and you take a deep breath and get as much air in as you can. And then when you exhale, you've got a large volume of air and you've got a strong cough and you can clear secretions. So what you can do with breath stacking is you can inflate the lung um, and have somebody do that for you, or you can do it yourself to a degree. Um, it's just ma ma manually, you can do it with an ambu bag and a one-way valve and a mouthpiece. And you basically just inflate your lung up um, and still, instead of taking one breath, you, you take one breath, the equivalent of one breath, then another breath, and another breath until you know you're you're nice and full of air, and hopefully not too dizzy. And that usually takes you know two or three compressions on it with an ambu bag, and then you've you've packed in some extra air, and that serves two things. One thing is it allows you to cough better, so you can clear secretions. Um, but the other thing it does, if you do it on a regular basis, is maintain the flexibility of your chest wall. So as, as I was mentioning, your, your breathing muscles get enough activity by just breathing. Um, but uh, um, if you want to help with maintaining the flexibility of your chest wall, of your ribs and your, and your diaphragm, because your breaths, you're not taking a lot of deep breaths, you're not getting the normal expansion of your rib cage and lung, so they tend to stiffen a little bit. So with this breath, breath stacking, you, you actually inflate the lungs belong, beyond what you're normally doing. And that just increases the flexibility of the lungs and the chest wall. So it makes it easier to breathe, you know? And, and uh, so it has, if you do it on a regular basis, and I think one of the questions is, what is a regular basis to do that? But uh, we usually suggest doing uh, 10 inflations twice a day uh, to a pressure, like I say, so you don't get dizzy because it does impede blood return a little bit. Uh, and doing that on a regular basis does, we think, maintain the flexibility. And there's some data in, in certainly in Duchenne's muscular dystrophy supporting the fact that it, it, it slows the decline in lung function because if it's easier for the uh, muscles to expand the chest wall because it's more flexible, then the loss of you can you know maintain a better volume with the same amount of muscle strength. So it's it's effective for two reasons: this breath stacking. One is to help with coughing and clearing secretions. So when you do get an infection, it helps because you to clear secretions because your expiratory muscles, particularly in spinal cord injury, are affected. And it's hard to really push the air out. So using uh, the ambu bag, it can inflate you and get more air out. And then there's other techniques as well with abdominal compression. And if that's not effective enough, then there's the, the, manu the so mechanical cough assist device, which can help with clearing secretions. So there's two things, clearing secretions and also increasing the, or, uh, the flexibility of your chest, wall, and lungs. So it's, it makes it um, easier for your muscles to function. Uh, do we have to wear a mask out in public even when you have some problems breathing? Should we be wearing gloves out in public? So there are, there are different types of masks. Um, you know, the, the N95 ones, which are really only recommended if you're dealing in a hostile environment. Um, but if you're, you know, I, I, our environment's not that hostile now, but we are getting recommendation that we use just cloth masks or, or um, medical masks that, that aren't N95s. The, those masks are quite easy to breathe through. The N95 ones, which are really, like I say, in, in, for use in a hostile environment where you're concerned about aerosol generation and uh, airborne infection, those N95s are important. It's a little harder to breathe through those. So you don't want to be doing a whole lot of things if you're 
if your breathing muscles are a bit weakened to start with with the N95, but they're they're manageable as well. Um, but the right now it is recommended, I think, that if you're going out, that you use a cloth mask or um, a medical mask. It doesn't have to be an N95 mask. And in, in addition to social distancing, I think it's it's largely to prevent you're infecting other people, but I, I think it also has some effect at helping you as well. Just a couple more questions. Um, so that I, I think hopefully answers this question. I'm afraid of wheeling outdoors and passing someone on the sidewalk where I'm not able to move away six feet or more. So uh, would wearing a mask out in that situation be helpful for that? I think, I think it, 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 it's not, you know, guaranteed to help. I, but I think we do understand that those that the main mechanism of transfer of, of COVID-19 is droplet transmission. So if, if somebody is in your environment and they are within the six feet and they're, they cough, for example, if they're wearing a mask, it's better. <laughs> but if you're wearing a mask, it's going to help you to a degree. So I, I think they're, they're not that hard to work with and they're worth having. How careful does someone have to be around their spouse? So for example, my husband is still working downtown, commutes on the bus and SkyTrain, and then returns home while I've been staying in the majority of the time, with the exception of going to the grocery store maybe once a week with all my protective gear on. Right. So I think it depends where the person's, you know, where her husband is working. If he's working in an environment where there's potential exposure, um, and that's many places these days because we don't know exactly, although the, the prevalence is decreasing. Um, then the recommendations, I believe, are that you, you know, should remove your shoes, that you should um, wash your clothes, you should certainly wash your hands, and um, and and that way, you know, prevent bringing anything in from the outside. Last question before we open up the floor. Um, as a respirologist, would you recommend that parents with cervical level SCI continue to keep their school-aged children at home, especially the young ones? And if the children wore masks, would the risk of attending school be more acceptable? Yeah, I, I, you know, I, that's a good, a good question. How much is going to happen in the schools? I think everybody's measuring this very carefully. This would be a good question for your infectious disease uh, visitor next next week. Um, you know, I, I, as I said, I, I think masks in children are going to be pro problematic. They, they may limit the spread a little bit, but getting children to keep them on may be unrealistic. Um, and um, how protective they are is, is another question. I, I think they, they may help to a degree, but I don't, I haven't heard of that being done. Um, I, I, I know returning to school at this point is optional. Um, it's going to be limited and they're going to be very careful with social distancing and, and that sort of thing. Um, there is a, I think there, everybody's aware there is a potential for, for the infection to grow back a little bit. Um, so it's a very measured decision about that. I, I wouldn't say one way or the other whether or not they should let their children return. Um, I think it would be a, it's, it's not an easy decision. <laughs> as I'm also finding myself. <laughs> um, all right, well, that's the last um, question that I have. So uh, if anyone wants to use the little raise the hand feature, you just have to click on the participants button and there should be an option to raise your hand or Jocelyn, um, if there's any chat, anything in the chat you can type in. Uh, and Joss, maybe I'll just let you uh, go ahead and ask the question. There we go. Is it possible that COVID-19 could la just last in a trach patient who once had bronchitis? Could, could just last for a long while? Yeah, how long does it last mm. for in, in the secretions in the lung? I, I think it's a, it's a good question where, you know, the, we, we have had a number of COVID patients in the hospital and we're following them. Now we have a COVID clinic where we're looking at them and and seeing if we can help patients and also looking at the, the effect from a sort of academic perspective of this virus. Um, 
it, it, it can persist. Usually it's, it's gone after, you know, 14 days. And that's why we, we quarantined for 14 days. But there have, there have been cases where people have had it for as long as 55 days afterwards. And I don't think we understand why uh, people tend to harbor it longer. Some people, I don't think it's related to tracheostomy or anything to do with spinal cord injury. It's just something to do with the, the virus and whether the virus is capable of infecting people at that point in time uh, after the, your immune system has dealt with it. Um, it, it's, it but it's, it's still detected by this PCR technique. So um, it, it can certainly still be present. How viable it is, we don't, we don't know exactly. Uh, I had one question and I heard it the other day. If you're constantly closed, blowing your nose several times a day, does that help keep the virus from potentially entering your body and your lungs? So I'm not aware of any of that, that helping at all. Being an Englishman, I, I always think it's good to have a hanky and blow your nose, but <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I don't think there's anything. So the way the virus does work is it, it, as we know, it usually gets either you inhale the particles or you touch your face after you've been in contact with the virus and it gets into the mucous membranes. And so the mucous membranes of the nose, the virus adheres to the cells in your nose and then starts entering your cells and then it replicates. You know, the virus can't live outside of us. But it can live for up to you know, three or four, three to five days. But once that's passed, it's, it basically doesn't exist. It needs our host cells to, to maintain its life cycle. So we're trying to eliminate it by stopping it spreading to other people. Um, so there isn't a way that I'm aware of, of that blowing your nose, will, if the virus is there, will, it, will stop it from entering your cells and adhering. Um, so I, I don't think it's a bad idea. But I, you know, for example, one of the things we're looking at is, is using nitric oxide. It's um, a, uh, something that your own immune cells produce. And there's a way you can administer it as a liquid into your nostril or into your throat. And it can, there's a liquid that releases nitric oxide, which will do the same thing as your immune cells. And that can potentially clear um, the virus from your system. But that's a research project that's ongoing and uh, we don't we need to have a randomized control trial as you know science has taken a bit of a, a kick these days because people have been making statements uh, that really we as medical people find we like science to back things up and like i say for this nitric oxide we need to have some science okay now i was under the impression that you had to breathe the virus in so it actually has to hit any mucous membrane to start replicating. Yeah, it, that's right. You can you can breathe it in as a as a droplet, um, but you can it also can come by if it's on your hands and you touch your face. That's why we're told not to touch your face because it can enter the mucous membranes of your eyes, of your of your uh, mouth, or or through your nose. Um, my question is about again back to the masks. Just something I've been curious about is all the public health advice we've been getting is about uh, wearing masks um, as a way to prevent others from getting sick. But I get a bit confused about why a barrier like a mask would only work one way. So I'm thinking if, if it's preventing you from making others sick, wouldn't, ha wouldn't it also have some beneficial effect in preventing you from getting sick? So if it's the droplets, if it can't go out to, or less likely to go out to infect others. Um, shouldn't the same logic apply that droplets would be less likely to get into your system, making you sick? Yes, yeah, so I, I, you know, as a respirologist, I agree with you. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I suspect there is a protective effect and certainly with droplet transmission, that's the recommended way to deal with it. So medical, you know, medical masks, which aren't N95, do protect other people, but I think they probably also protect yourself as well. Um, just a question. I've been told that I'm on, um, I'm on CPAP and on, um, uh, oh, what do you call it? Uh, CPAP and a nebulizer. 
Okay. I'm told that I'm not allowed to do anything two hours prior to the carrier coming in because of COVID. Why would that be? So that's the other, um, the other side of the coin, you know, in, in the hospital environment or where these kinds of devices are, or in your homes where they are, CPAP or a nebulizer, they, they do have the potential to cause aerosol. And aerosol is, is those are very small particles that are carrying the virus that remain suspended in the air for a period of time. So what people are trying to do is estimate what the clearance rate of, of the air is in your room and, and saying, you know, is it two hours? That um, should allow, um, you know, if you've got any kind of ventilation there at all, should allow the, air, the room air to be changed. And if there was anything in the air that was generated by your CPAP or your nebulizer, it should have cleared by that time, by two hours. And that's sort of a guesstimate. But, and that's assuming that you potentially have COVID and that uh, if you don't have COVID, then there's no risk. But, you know, the people are concerned because we know now that asymptomatic people who don't exhibit any symptoms can have COVID and, and transmit it. So it's protecting your, your, uh, your, your care rates. Um, but I'm interested with the CDC release from two days ago that said that uh, they don't feel that the virus is transmitting on surfaces, high touch surfaces, as much as they originally thought in the beginning. And I'm wondering if um, within your circles, if there's any conversations about that. Um, no, I, I, I think at, at this point, we're very careful at washing down surfaces where people are being um, in environments where they're potentially coughing or um, um, working hard to breathe or generating aerosols where it hasn't really got into practice yet. I think these are things that we'll, we'll learn from this, this uh, pandemic about um, how long the particles exist, or how long these viruses exist on surfaces. And, um, yeah, and I, I don't think it's really impacted care yet because this is something we may be able to do in hindsight when things settle down. We may be able to re reassemble ourselves and see what we really need to do to have a big impact. I had a question about if a person spinal cord injured person, or I don't know what just the regular COVID protocol is in ICU. If somebody is put on a ventilator, do they are they um, given conscious sedation, or are they sedated? Do or or are they so hypoxic they don't know what's going on? Or right, so sedation is is always given, um, in, in in most cases because if you're on a ventilator and you don't have any neurological problem, then um, yeah, you would, would be aware of what's going on. So conscious sedation is certainly given, um, but it's not continuous. Um, sometimes paralytic agents are given where you're given something to relax the muscles so you don't fight against the ventilator to reduce the injury in your lung. So, um, and in that case, often uh, sedation accompanies that. Uh, so in in um, in some cases though it's clear that people are very comfortable on a ventilator, and then there's no need to to do sedation. You get used to it after a bit. It's interesting what we can get used to. Yeah, I also heard on the news that they are finding COVID patients if they are proning them. That seems to help. Yeah. Yeah, that's um. So that's a way of reducing the injury in the lung. And, and um, you know, as I mentioned, the lung gets very stiff and it's particularly in one position, some of the more of the inflammation may be in the bottom part of your lung because you're lying on your back a lot of the time when you're in hospital. So shifting you over to the, onto your tummy can allow the, the ventilator to inflate a part of the lung that may be a little more easy to inflate. And, uh, and there's good data in ARDS, that, that condition where your lungs get filled with fluid, um, in, in non-COVID situations, that that improves survival. So it's a, it's a technique that we can readily use here because we have a lot of experience with ARDS, which is the, the lung's response to this in, in inflammatory injury. But from what I've heard, 
you know, the way this coronavirus attacks the lungs is very different in the way that pneumonia um, attacks the lungs. Could you maybe give us a quick overview of the differences between pneumonia and the way COVID uh, infects the lungs and attacks the lungs? Um, it, I mean, this virus has, has attracted a lot of attention. So we've, we've focused and it's obviously affecting a lot of people. So we're as assembling a lot of information and there's lots of publication now on CT imaging in, in the lung. And it tends to go through the fairly predictable sequence. It starts out with it's a little bit of inflammation and we call it ground glass opacities where you, you may even miss it on the chest X-ray, but on a CT scan, you can see this early amount of inflammation in the lung. And then it sort of progresses over the, a week to 10 days to be in a, a, what we call a dense consolidation. So the lung becomes basically filled with in, inflammatory cells, um, uh, like an exudate or very thick mucus. And, uh, and then the lungs, the, it, it becomes very densely packed and lungs get quite stiff. And it can progress if it really triggers this inflammatory cascade, this what we call a cytokine storm, cytokine storm, then the whole lung becomes inflamed. So mm -hmm. it, it, the lung, it can just be, and this is it's not a, that atypical a presentation for a pneumonia. Um, one that sometimes will just stop at the early stages if your immune system deals with it, or it may progress through those phases to uh, to pneumonia or and eventually to this acute lung injury or ARDS, adult respiratory distress syndrome, which again, it's an inflammatory process that, that can slowly resolve. It sometimes can leave some scarring in your lung afterwards. And, uh, but but I, I think in, in general, we could say it's not that atypical. The thing that is atypical is this presentation with the normal, um, not, the lung not losing its stiffness and people getting quite hypoxic you know, without being really aware that their lungs are inflamed. I, th I think that's, that's quite unusual. Well, I just want to uh, sincerely thank you, Dr. Rode, for being here with us today. Um, it was very informative and I think alleviates a lot of fears that a lot of our community, including myself, have during this time. So I really appreciate um, you being so open and uh, and answering all our questions. So well, it's my pleasure and thanks for your questions. And if you can send me the uh, two articles that were sent in um, re regarding the, the spinal cord injury and, and uh, coronavirus, that would be great. Well, thank you everybody so much. Thanks for all your great questions.